Okay, so um, we have, believe it or not, uh, 50 participants uh, now part of our um, Ontario or part of our True North Character Carvers group, which is just terrific. And we're, we're from all over the country at this point. So that, that's really nice. Um, tonight, we have how many people? 18 people, 20 people, something 19, like that? 19, no. 19, okay. And so maybe some others will join, but maybe uh, everybody's been out gardening and they're pooped out and... Uh, and relaxing now so we'll see but whoever joins us great but as murray was saying uh if you miss any of these you can always get back to it by uh, checking out the video all right so i'm just going to go through some slides today uh welcome everyone again for those um new to the group here um this is something that uh mike sullivan john paul andre and i talked about several times over the last couple of years to try to get a group together to just focus on caricature carving in, in Canada. So a Canadian caricature carving group. And Mike was the one that came up with the notion of true North caricature carvers. And so that's what we're calling ourselves. Um, you know, we kind of got going right when COVID hit us. So uh, we're starting off with these Zoom calls. We hope what it gets us to is being able to see each other live at some point uh, across at least Ontario. And for those that can't travel to uh, these uh, live sessions, we'll have them zoom in. But I think it's turning into being something that's going to be a lot of fun for all of us. And uh, we're really welcoming everybody's participation on this. Um, just a, a couple of reminders that um, what's really important is that everybody participates, although I've got most of the slides here and uh, Mike and John and I haven't rehearsed any of this. Uh, Mike and John are going to jump in with their comments, and you should be jumping in with your comments as well. And um, so let's make sure that, uh, that everybody's participating. Uh, we really want to encourage everybody's sharing ideas. Um, we're not all in the same place when it comes to caricature carving. Some of, them are, some of us are just starting out. Others have been at it for decades. So let's respect each other and uh, where we are in that process. And uh, remember that... Uh, even the simplest questions are, are really welcome, okay? Um, what we're gonna do tonight is we're going to briefly review what we've covered already. So we've talked about things like safety, uh, how to come up with ideas. Um, John led a really good discussion on drawing. Mike led a great discussion on sculpting. Uh, I, I talked a little bit about roughing in your uh, carving. So we're gonna spend a minute. If anybody has any questions or wants to see a review of that, we'll spend some time doing that. Um, and then we're going to talk about aspects of sharpening that was raised at our last meeting and we thought it was a great idea. I've put a few charts together in that regard. And it's the way that I've been sharpening for uh, for some time, but I'm sure you guys have your pet ways of doing it as well. So let's share ideas on that. And then we're going to finish off uh, our hour and a half together by talking about the next step after roughing in the carving. How do you add detail and some things to think about when you're adding detail? So Murray, I thought maybe you could help us by just giving us a, a two minute review again on Zoom so that we know all about muting and the uh, video and, uh, and the different options we have to look at. Certainly one thing you need to do is probably mute your mic on your screen if you're on a PC bottom left of the window will be a little microphone click on that till a red line goes through it and the same on the ipad i'm not sure i think ipads maybe have a top left hand side they're all a little bit different but as you come on and uh, <clears throat> the invitation is given to you to maybe ask a question simply push your space bar will unmute your microphone so i think that's about it the recording is taking place <clears throat> and it'll be a great video tonight. Okay, that's great. Okay, so why don't we get started? Uh, Mike and uh, John Paul, do you have anything to add to the little bit I've uh, covered here on the discussion for tonight? Actually, ahead, it, was, it was John Paul that came up with the True North caricature name, not me. Oh, oh, I, <laughs> so, thought, I, thought, I thought that was you. No, it was John Paul. Hmm. Well, I'm surprised that John Paul would be able to come up with something so creative. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, so let's talk about some of the things that we've covered. Um, just from anybody uh, on the call tonight, are there any questions on any of the aspects of the things we covered? Uh, safety, coming up with ideas, drawing, sculpting, roughing in. 
Anything you'd like us to repeat or go over briefly again? I'd just like to make a comment about the idea of wearing a glove to protect your hand when you're carving and a thumb guard. I see a lot of people who say, oh, I can't carve with a glove on. They forget that they're not actually carving with the glove on, they're holding the material. Yeah. And I've gone through probably four or five leather gloves in the past 14 years. Uh, every one of them's cut to rags. But the piece inside that was a liner made of a variety of things like Kevlar isn't cut at all. So if you don't protect that hand, and I could, if you want to do close-ups, I could show you a couple of scars you get from not protecting your hand or hands. <laughs> Just, I, I see a lot of beginners who are, they're not taught to use the glove, um, you, primarily because the person doing the instruction doesn't like it. So you wind up with four or five beginners who don't think that's important until you have to get the band-aids out or worse. I have one as well to mention, if I could. Gloves are important. Can everybody hear me okay? Yep. yep. Great. Another thing that I think is important is something to cover your leg or your some kind of an apron to cover your lower extremities. A lot of people put the carve on their leg and use it as a support. And uh, I've seen some uh, pretty good gouges, even from accomplished people putting knives through their leg. Mm -hmm. uh, leather seems to work well. And I thought that must be something that people should consider as well. Mm -hmm. That's it. Very good. We had one fellow who stuck a knife straight into his thigh. He was wearing an apron, but he missed the apron. When he got out of the hospital, after 13 stitches in his leg, he came back to carving about three weeks later, and he had glued a piece of carpet on the back of his apron and pulled it down far enough to cover him right to the knees. Mm. <laughs> I think you need a hammer and a nail to get through that yeah. one. <laughs> No, those are really those are really appropriate comments as well to uh, what we're going to be talking about tonight because we're going to be talking about sharpening your knife, and uh, you know Ken mentioned that um, there's the wrap that you can buy. I tend to buy it from Lee Valley, but you can get it anywhere, and it's a protective wrap that you can put around your thumb. And uh, uh, when when we're going to be talking about sharpening tonight. Um, we're going to be getting the knife so sharp that just touching your thumb is going to cut your thumb. It's going to leave a little imprint on your thumb. So those, those wraps are really important. Okay, so um, how, is this, uh, how is this working for everyone, the chat and, or the, uh, the video and the presentation? I'm, I'm looking at my presentation right now, the words discussion. I see John's video. Okay, I see, I see a different video now. All right, is everybody able to see my video, the picture of me, or just the discussion? Uh, Dan, Dan Sloan here, and yeah, I can see a picture of you up in the corner, small picture, okay. and okay. your presentation, it's all working and looking good. Okay, thank you, Dan. All right, so, um, so there were, there, th those were a few good questions around things we covered. Uh, Mike and John, is there anything you'd like to take an opportunity to write, remind people of um, other than the safety discussion we have in, in terms of drawing and sculpting? Yeah, uh, for me, the only thing for me is uh, for protective uh, for my hand. I use this. I showed everybody before, but I, I use this uh, piece of dowel or I made this uh, handle to carve. So I got my hand here. And I'm, I'm carving over here, like there's a knife. So I'm carving like this. So it, it, I, I, I shouldn't, shouldn't say it, but I never get cut. Not once in a while I get cut, but not very often. But uh, I like using this handle. You can use a dowel if you wanted to, but mm -hmm. I, I put a full carving on there and I, I uh, carve away on it. But right away I put this, uh, like the carving on the on the dowel. On the, on the handle. Yeah, and there's just a screw on the end of that handle, right? Yeah, just a screw. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
I personally don't like using a glove. I never used a glove. I tried it different times over the years. And then when Murray gave the challenge of a four inch carving, I thought I better wear a glove. So I started wearing a glove and uh, Mark suggested that green tape for the thumb. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I have that on the go all the time and I'm getting used to using a glove but I find when I grab a pencil to make a, a mark on the uh, carving that I'm doing, I tend not to put my glove and my thumb guard back on. And everything is lucky so far, but the smaller the carving, the more care you have to take. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in terms of the glove, Alec, I, I use the glove on the non uh, working hands, so the hand yeah, that holds the carving. Yeah, okay, and then as I put the I. thumb guard on my working hand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I was. Yeah, always... I guess it's something you have to take, you have to get used to over time. I I've been doing it a long time, so I, I I wouldn't feel right not having it right now. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to get out a pencil for, to get exactly what you want with that on. I, I you don't if you don't feel it, you can't. Yeah. You know, it's just yeah. not there. Yeah, but I, I used to carve uh, my carvings were generally like 10 to 12 inches. Mm -hmm. Now they're like six to eight and then four to six. Mm -hmm. So I, I am getting smaller carvings now. And I, I need it's a faster carve for one, but it's harder to put the detail in. So I, I appreciate the safety. Mm -hmm. I appreciate what you guys are passing on mm -hmm. as information and uh, I have gone to a more safer workplace, I guess. Yeah, that's good. That's really good. Yeah. Okay, well, why don't we uh, move to the next topic then? And, uh, and that's sharpening. And so I put a few slides together. And again, um, this isn't supposed to be a soliloquy. So if, uh, if you have some comments, please jump in, okay? So from a sharpening standpoint, I mentioned to you guys before that I've been I've been carving since I was a boy. And this was the knife I used as a boy. And um, you can see it's pretty beaten up. It's very thin, as you can see, because I spent as much time sharpening it as I did carving with it. And at that time, my dad would have had um, a sharpening stone called a carborundum stone. You might have one in your shop. Uh, very popular in the 60s and 70s. And he would have taught me how to sharpen that knife with a little bit of oil, a little bit of household oil on the, uh, on the stone, and then kind of rotating that knife in circles until I got uh, a half decent um, uh, edge on it. And that's, that's kind of what I knew about sharpening at the time. And I, I did a lot of my carvings in the 60s and 70s with this kind of a knife and knives like it. Uh, now, this one looks a little bit more beaten up for, for age, but um, basically that was it. And you can, you can look at it on your screen and you can see the scores even on the top of the shank where I would have, you know, as a kid, sharpened it a little bit higher than the edge. Um, but that's what I would have done. That's how I would have done it. Now, what does a carving look like with a blade that you sharpened like that? And, and think of those carborundum stones or those... Um, handheld stones that you might have in your workshop or even your kitchen at one time, what would that look like? And that's, way, that's the way that particular knife cuts right now into basswood. And so just take a good look at that. You can see how rough it is. Uh, I can tell you that cutting that piece of basswood was really, I really had to pull the knife towards my thumb with the, to, to make the, any of those cuts. Um, you could see it's scored. You can see the fibers of the wood are broken rather than cut. And so when I think, when I think of a piece of wood that I'm carving, I think of it like the hairs on a, on a paintbrush um, that you'd use in, you know, to paint a bedroom or something. And so when I'm cutting, I'm really cutting all of those hairs and I'm pulling on all those hairs. They're the grains of wood. And if I can cut those off real cleanly, I have a real nice looking piece of wood. If I can't cut those off, it's like pulling the hairs until they break on the paintbrush. And you can almost look at this piece of wood and you can see each of those individual grains 
the breaking. They're all snapping. They've kind of turned up on their head. Uh, Fertis, who's on the line, uh, sent me an email earlier asking, you know, is there anything I can do about a, a carving that is getting a little bit fuzzy? Well, one of the reasons why a carving does get fuzzy is because you're breaking those fibers of the grain and they're turning up on the end like that. So although I had used that carborundum stone and I had put oil on it and I'd done everything I could, even as a young teenager, um, that's the kind of cut that you would expect from simply going to a carborundum stone, okay? This is a bit of a sharper knife. Now it's not a tragically sharp knife. Um, it, it's a knife that I haven't sharpened in a little while. It's a really good knife, um, but you can see it's got a different polish to it. Um, something I'm gonna come back to is the different uh, uh, planes of the blade. So you can see there's a flat portion up at the top of the shank of the blade. There's a beveled portion. Uh, that beveled portion is just to get, a, get uh, get away from the wood, let the wood have some room to be cut. And then there's a very shiny portion at the, at the edge that's really the cutting edge. Can you guys see this arrow that I just put up? Yep. Okay, so here's the flat section, there's a beveled section, and here's the very, very cutting edge, this bright cutting edge, okay? And so that's, that's a sharper knife for sure. So take a look at that versus the one I would have been using as a, as a young fella. Totally different look, right? Probably very much the same steel, but a totally different process of sharpening. Now, what does that look like? Well, that's what that looks like. So you can see, um, as opposed to the first uh, photo of the basswood, um, the fibers are starting to get cut. If you take a really good look at it, you can see there's still some striations there, particularly up in here. There's still some pulled fibers. You can see it's almost modeled here. So it, the, the fibers are still being put, not really cut cleanly. It's a long shot from that, but it's still not where you want to be. I can also tell you that when cutting that and, uh, and pulling, the knife, pulling the knife towards myself against my thumb, it would glide a little bit better for sure. But then you'd feel it catch and it'd glide and you know, it would catch a little bit more. So it wasn't a clean, even uh, pressure that you put on the knife. Okay. Now here's a picture of um, a very sharp knife. So again, I'm not making the case that one knife is better than the other. Or one metal is better than the other in the blade, but the sharpening process was different. So here again, you can see those three areas. I think this was the one I showed you last time. These three areas, the flat portion, the beveled portion, and then the cutting edge, which is at a different bevel again, okay? Now with this knife, I would have uh, used a, a different sharpening process, gone a little bit further with the sharpening process, and here's the same piece of basswood, okay? So it might be a little bit difficult to see. Here was the one that was a not bad sharp. You could still see broken fibers. There are no broken fibers in this, and so it was... I can tell you that pulling it with the blade was smooth. Uh, it was even. There weren't, you know, any uh, any sensation of catching it or putting a, a higher pressure on the blade at any point in its travel. It just cut off really smoothly. I took a picture of the same piece of wood having used this knife, and that's this picture here. And I just did it because I wanted to show you the shine that you would get. And, and this picture really doesn't do it justice. But one of the things you'll um, learn to recognize when your knife is super, super sharp is that you get a shine to every cut you make. So every slice you make, you'll not have any breaks in the fibers. There'll be no fuzzy sections if you want or rough sections. And when you run your thumb over it, it'll feel almost like it's waxed. It'll be, it'll be that smooth, it'll feel like it's waxed, okay? So I'm just going to pause there, and if anybody has any comments or questions at that point before I go on. Okay. I think uh, when it's that sharp and it's effortless, that's when you uh, uh, you won't get cut because it's, it's effortless and it's just very smooth, and you, you get the job done really quick. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, and John, that's another thing that my dad used to tell me as a kid is that when you when you cut your finger, Mark, it's yeah. going to be because your knife was too dull and you lost right. control of the knife. So it, when it's this sharp and you're cutting, you, the the knife is doing the work. The knife is determining where it's going to go. Um, when it's dull, the wood is determining where the knife is going to go. You're going to hit a hard spot in the wood or or something. And all of a sudden, that's going to move the knife in the wrong direction, and that's where you're going to get hurt. Okay. Well, then you put more pressure on that. You're, you're, you're uh, trying to cut it harder, yeah. and that's when it slips. Yeah, that's right. right. Hey, Mark, I have a comment. This is for those. Yeah. Uh, I do get fuzzies, like usually not on like a plane like that, but when I'm trying to dig in uh, between two tight spaces, yeah, like I get fuzzies and the fibers don't come out. Yeah. Early. That's, yeah. that's probably my... Yeah. So, so Fertis, what, what you'll find is if, um, if your knife, if you can get your knife to be razor sharp, you'll be able to get into those tight spaces. Because often those tight spaces, you're really going, you're trying to cut in the wrong direction of the wood because you have to, because that's the, the space that you've got to work in. You know, ideally, you know, if the grain is like this, I can't see my picture, but if you can see my hand, if the grain is in this direction and you're cutting with your knife like this, that's the prime way to cut through the wood because it's, it's just like those filaments on a paintbrush. You're pulling each individual hair and cutting them off individually. You get a nice crisp line. If you're cutting this way, it's going to fray, right? And so often in those tight spaces, like under an arm or between the neck and the shoulder on a caricature, the grain is not going in the optimum direction. And so the only way to deal with that is to have an ultra sharp knife. You're going, you know, you're going in the wrong direction of the grain. And so you need a really sharp knife so that you're not crushing each one of those fibers of wood. Okay. 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 Hey, so Mark, can I, can I add, uh, when, when you're uh, carving a line, I never, I never go in straight in. I always go on an angle, a slight angle. And when I cut with them in my next cut, like to cut the, that piece out, it's bang like that. If I went straight in, now we have to cut like this, and then I got to cut like this. That's where you get the burr in here. So I always go in just a slight angle, and it goes slight angle over here, and it pops right out. Okay, good. Okay, so going back to this notion of the, you know, the different uh, levels of sharpness in knives. So this is this is clearly a dull knife. Here's what my carvings would have looked like as a younger person, okay? And so this, this is a caricature carving of a mountain man, and you've probably all seen the patterns for that mountain man. But just take a close look as I look back at this carving. Like, look in here. Um, you know, there's something going on with the wood there. Now, the grain would have been going in this direction, and so I would have been able to cut up like this, but nonetheless, it got pretty... It got pretty, I don't know, fuzzy, I guess, right in here. You can also see striations there and there, down here, that really weren't intended to be wrinkles or anything. They're just striations, all right? And then if you look at the side here, you can see again, you know, trying to put in a little bit of detail with a knife that isn't as sharp as it should be, you get broken fibers down in here. So I see a fiber there, I see fibers here. This is kind of looking a little bit ragged. Again, you can see the striations pretty clearly down in here. Again, on the other side of this carving, you can see where the knife actually chattered, if you want. So because, it, you know, and it's John's earlier point that when the knife is sharp, it's gonna go where you want it to go. Well, the knife wasn't sharp, and so it kind of chattered, it kind of bounced, if you want, and that's why I got those. You, you can imagine that I used the knife probably in this direction to cut this, and it chattered along the way. You can see some chatter marks down here as well, okay? And so, and then down here where his little, uh, his pants are drooping from his um, suspender, again, that's looking pretty rough down in here. It's certainly not, it's not that crisp, clean cut that I was describing to you that almost feels like a waxed finish. That, that looks almost like a, a pebbled finish. Okay, you following that okay? Yep. Okay, so here's a carving that I would have done more recently. And um, now th this carving would have been a very sharp knife. Now, 
appreciate that the 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 head that you're looking at is probably I don't know maybe it's two inches so it's it's blowing up quite a bit here but there is absolutely really no chatter marks in this um, it was a sharp knife that made nice even cuts uh, you can imagine that as you got to this little eyeball remember this is probably all of two inches as you got to that little eyeball and we're trying to put these eyelid lines in and these wrinkles, if you're trying to get the roundness of that eyeball, there's no way you would have been able to do that with a dull knife because you would have been crushing the fibers all along. And as soon as you tried to create this lid, it would have broken off, okay? And so, so that's really the, the value of really taking time to really sharpen the knife, like razor sharp, surgical sharp, so that when you just touch the wood, the wood fibers are going to uh, cut away cleanly. Okay. Any comments from anyone? Any additional input? Okay, I'm going to keep going, but you guys stop me when uh, if you want to go back to something. Okay. All right. So when you when you think about sharpening, you're you're talking about grit. Um, grit is the um, number of abrasive bits that fit within a square inch. Okay, so if you have 600 grit, 600 abrasive bits fit within a square inch. If you have 80 grit, 80 abrasive bits fit within um, a square inch. Sometimes it's referred to as mesh. And that just means that those abrasive bits would, fought, would have been able to work their way through a mesh of one square inch. And that's how many abrasive bits would fall through. Okay, it's more commonly to be known as grit. When you get into grinding stones um, and polishing stones, uh, it's often called grit. In fact, that's really the only one that I refer to, but it'll also be called microns. So if you go to buy something, it might say that it's a quarter of a micron. A micron is, is basically a thousand microns fit within one millimeter. And so you know what one millimeter looks like, right? It's, I don't know, what is it like a, 30th of a 32nd of an inch was this kind of the imperial unit that I have in mind pretty darn small half a 16th right so one millimeter is that much when you're talking about of a quarter micron grinding stone it's a quarter of one one thousandth of a millimeter so it's really fine stuff okay but we're going to be talking about grit today now this on the uh, left of the photo is 600 grit. And so you might have used 600 grit if you ever did body work on your car or anything. Very, very smooth. This happens to be 80 grit. If you do woodworking, that's, you'd probably hit something with 80 grit as the first cut at, at taking a lot of wood away. Okay. Uh, if you haven't used 600 grit, um, 600 is pretty close to 800. And 800 grit is, is, is basically the same as a brown paper bag. So if you take a, an old brown paper lunch bag and crinkle it up, that's about 800 grit. Um, so 600 grit, you can imagine, is pretty smooth stuff, okay? So we're going to be talking about grits. Uh, the other thing we're going to be talking about is um, honing or polishing. So after you've um, sharpened your knife with appropriate grit, either a stone or a paper, you're going to polish it or hone it now. Th this is a polishing block that, uh, that I've bought from FlexCut, and it's probably about uh, five inches by five inches. You can see it has a number of different contours. You can put a V-tool in there, different size gouges. By putting some rub, a polishing compound in there, you just drag your knife over it and, and you polish. And so we're gonna be coming back to that. The reverse side of it, it looks like this. It's got a couple of other shapes, but it's got, it's got a leather strop there as well. And so again, when you're polishing your knife, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, you're polishing it on a leather strop, okay? All right, so. This next piece, we're probably going to edit out of the video, um, Murray, because I, I, although I tried to get permission from the person who has this these two photos on their website, I wasn't able to do that. But I'll tell you guys right now that if you're really interested, you know, at the level of, uh, you know, metallurgy in sharpening, there's a really good um, 
website, a blog called Science of Sharp, and it's scienceofsharp.com. And he, he really talks about the ins and outs of sharpening. I, I, I don't know, I find it really interesting. You might too. This picture was interesting to me for this reason. We talked about this uh, grit before and the 600 being pretty smooth and the 80 being pretty darn rough. This is a picture of a blade magnified a thousand times that's been sharpened with 600 grit stone or paper. Okay. So I think that's impressive because, you know, when I, again, when I was a kid, um, the stone that we had was probably about 700 grit. When you have a, a stone like a carborundum stone in your workshop, or if you have a carborundum stone in your kitchen drawer, that's probably about a 700 grit stone. And it's, you, you can see the level of sharpening that that 700 grit stone is doing to the, to the metal. This is the same thing, 1,000 times magnification of 2,000 grit. Okay, so, you know, arguably a thousand times magnification is pretty significant, but you can see the difference between a 600 grit and a 2000 grit, you know, and so the 2000 grit in a lot of people's minds isn't a very fine grit in terms of sharpening stones, like they're sharpening at like 8000 grit. And so even at 2000, um, which is a pretty smooth stone, you're, you're getting abrasive marks in it. Okay. Any comments? Okay. So when you think about grit and you think of those pictures we just looked at, um, a, a lot of people would say that when you're sharpening and you're using 600 grit paper or 600 grit stone, you're really just coarse sharpening. So you're doing a very coarse rudimentary level of sharpening of your stone. And again, that's what I would have carved with for many years. And maybe that's what some of the people on our, you know, the 50 people that are involved with these uh, conversations are carving with right now. <coughs> 600 grit is, is viewed as a coarse sharpening. A medium sharpening is about 1200 grit. Now, if any of you have those carborundum stones, uh, you know, from the 60s and 70s, um, some of them are actually split and you can see that one side has one color, turn it over and you can see a, a line down it, it has a different color. Those are typically 700 on one side and 1200 on the other. Okay, so, you know, if you're, if you're starting at the 600 and you're sharpening your blade and you're turning it over to your 1200 and sharpening the blade, you're doing the right thing but you're probably only at what most people would refer to as a medium sharpening level. You'll have a, you'll have a, a sharp blade, but it really won't be sharp enough to do what we're talking about in terms of, you know, just touching the wood and being able to cut those fibers, right? Typically people talk about fine sharpening when you get around 4,500 grit. Um, you know, um, you know, those, uh, really nice units. Uh, I think they're called Tormec. Tormek unit. They have a large, uh, they have a large stone on it. It's probably, it looks to me like about an inch and a half stone rotates fairly slowly. They have a leather strop on the other side. It looks like a grinder, but it's, it's very slow. That very fine sharpening grinder or a disc or stone is, is about 4,500 grit. So, oh. so, so that'll take you to, you know, that 4,500 level if you had something like that. Um, I'll show you a picture of a, a stone that I use. I think it's probably 4,500 to 6,000, okay? Um, beyond that, you know, some people will say that uh, you really should go well beyond the 4,500 grit and they're sharpening at 8,000 grit. And 8,000 grit is like a plate of glass. I mean, it, it is that smooth, but they're doing their final sharpening at 8,000 grit. Um, and then finally, honing. Um, many of us have a leather strop, or uh, maybe we'll have a, a, a mechanical leather strop that, that uh, rotates for us. Um, and we put a honing compound on that. And you can get honing compound at a variety of different places. But that tends to be like 40, 50, 60,000 grit. And so that is really polishing now. So when you look at 
fine sharpening at 4,500 grit and then taking a, a magnitude of 10 leap to 50,000 honing, I can understand why some people would rather take the next step and go to 8,000 grit, grit after 4,500. My personal experience is I'm pretty good at 4,500. I get a pr pretty sharp knife at 4,500. I still hone with that 50,000 grit and, uh, and I hone regularly. And so after my knife is sharpened, I'll hone that knife maybe every 15 minutes while I'm carving, okay? Because it'll lose its edge to that degree. Okay. Um, uh, Mark, ask a question? Sure, Go ahead, sure. sir. Go ahead. Uh, okay, my question is uh, the leather, uh, where, where would you put leather in stropping uh, measurement wise? Well, th that would be the honing. So you, usually when you use that leather, you're using it with a polishing compound. Right. Um, and so that you're, you're, you're up around 40, 50, 60,000 um, grit at that point. Terrific, thank you. Yeah. Uh, Mark, I just interject here that that uh, particular compound, of, the first one is Jeweler's Rouge, the old one on the barber's chair, uh, the strop. And then they went to the green compound, which is much finer. And then the gold or the yellow color is one of the finest ones there is. I didn't know that. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I've just used the green stuff and I got a picture of it coming up here. I've used the green stuff from Lee Valley and I know it's, uh, I know it's like 50,000 grit, but you, you raise a good point. So remember the barber, right? With the straight edge, you know, straight razor and he would, <laughs> He would do that regularly. He didn't do it at the beginning of his workday. He did that throughout the workday because he was at, you know, he was working at that, you know, probably 20, 30, 40,000 without a compound on it. And, um, and, and he was honing that knife so it would stay razor sharp. Hey, Mark. Question. Go ahead. Okay. My question, Mark, is uh, do you use a handheld strop or you use electric? Yeah, I, I, I use that little one that I showed you here, Alec. Um, okay. Well, you know, you know, if I'm in the backyard or something like that, I'll use that one. I do have an electric one and I'll show you, I kind of cheated on the electric one. It's nothing more than a Dremel one inch sander with a leather belt on it, so, but I'll show mm -hmm. you that in a minute. Um, okay. I used it, to use uh, FlexCut and I would use that little strop and then I purchased a, uh, a 10 inch and it had diamond dust on it hmm. and it worked really good. It had four different levels of diamond dust hmm. and I forget the numbers right now, but uh, I have since switched over to uh, tool steel. I use two cherries. Mm -hmm. I have uh, gouges and V-tools. I was bruising my uh, V-tools in, in flex cut that bad that they would curl because I'm pushing <laughs> too hard. That's my Is fault. That right? wow. Wow. Yeah. And uh, anyways, so I switched to two cherries. I found that uh, this hand strop took too long because it's tool steel. Mm -hmm. So I, I bought the, uh, the one from uh, Chipping Away. It's a uh, interchangeable leather. It's got uh, uh, different sanding grits. So I just use the leather and I use that with the uh, green compound. Yeah, that's really good. Yeah. So, so let me show question, you. Here, here's the question on the stropping. Um, I use a belt typically for stropping, and there's a rough side and the smooth side. Can you use both sides? Do you get a better sharpening on the smooth side, or is the rough side okay? Uh, I don't know the answer to that question. You can see on this one, it is the it is the rough side. Um, you know, just picking up on what Alec was saying. Here's what I did to a little uh, a little delta sander. And so that's a one inch wide piece of sandpaper that's supposed to go on there, but you can get a leather strop to fit it. And so Stan, one side is smooth. You're looking at the smooth side here. One side is rougher. I've used both sides, to be honest with you. Um, the, it, the downside of using this, it's very fast. Um, the one that Alex spoke to uh, that he got it chipping away is fairly slow RPM, I think, isn't it, Alex? Uh, 650. Yeah, so this one, this one is considerably faster. And so you gotta be careful. You gotta be careful. You wouldn't leave the, the knife on it too long. I don't know if you can burn 
you know, the, the kind of steel that are in these knives, but I'm very cautious that I just touch it when I use this. But on, on most days when I'm just carving and I have something at my, my table here, I just use that and I just, and I just polish it up with that. Thank you. Okay. So, so let's, uh, you know, come back to any of this at any point of this discussion. I really appreciate your participation, but let's, let, let's come back and talk a little bit more about sharpening. So I, I mentioned to you that here's an example of a knife that has a flat edge here. Um, then it bevels here. And then there's a third bevel here. And that's the really bright piece you see. So that, that, that whole thing is beveled just so that the chips can be removed from the wood, right? This here is really the cutting section. So when you're sharpening, you're not talking about sharpening from this to this. You're talking about sharpening this little bright area, okay? And you see the same thing. Like here's a very old skew chisel that I, that I still occasionally uh, carve with. My dad bought me this, I think, when I was 15, uh, these tools. And it's probably not the greatest steel, but again, you see the same thing is that the bevel starts back here, but the real piece of business is this bright part. And that's the part that you're, you're, you're um, grinding and that you're, you're honing. Okay. All right. So let's take a look at that. So this picture I just made to just demonstrate that you can see the different edges. Okay. So if this is a cross section of your knife, you have a bevel that would come right down to here, but it's this section that is at a different angle that is really what you're sharpening. Okay, makes sense to everybody? If this here colored piece at the bottom is your, um, the whatever grinding stone you're using or uh, you know, like, like that carborundum that I mentioned, you're basically dragging that little tip at the end of the bevel lightly across that stone. Now, how, how, what angle should that be? I've heard people talk about, you know, if you can fit, if you can fit a quarter underneath, a flat quarter underneath the edge of your um, knife here, you got about the right angle, okay? But you have to determine that yourself because that depends on the length of this shank too, right? But if you can fit a, a quarter back in here, you probably have about the right angle, all right? Um, now I showed the arrow going in this direction. I'm not sure why I do this, but I always draw the knife when I'm sharpening towards me. I never push the knife into the grinding storm. Um, my dad probably showed me how, you know, to do it was kind of like rotating it on, uh, on the oil base. Um, I pull it towards me. And, and I've been reading that, that people who really you know, get granular if you want about sharpening. There's a camp of people that would say, always pull the knife because the metal that you're leaving behind is being washed away by the oil or the water on the stone, and you're not pushing into that and damaging the metal. I don't know if that's valid or not. Uh, you know, that's something you can play with yourselves, but I, but I will tell you, I always draw the knife toward me. Um, and I always put water on the stone. There was a time where I would put oil on the stone. Um, I always put water on the stone. And the water, the, the purpose of any fluid, oil or water, is to move those little microscopic pieces of uh, metal that you're taking off the edge of that knife to move them out of the way, to flow them out of the way. So ideally, um, you have, in the absolute ideal situation, you have a, a grindstone that's at the right grit that is taking metal off of your knife and then being washed before it's introduced to the knife again. So that's in the ideal situation. Very few of us have that ideal situation. So, so we just put water on and make sure that the, as much as possible, the, met, the metal parts are being moved away by the water. Okay. So what's happening when you do that? So th this isn't a great picture. I didn't get the angles right, but you know what I'm trying to get at. So as you're moving this, this edge, this fine edge, the second bevel on your knife along the grinding medium, what's happening is a little burr is coming up the length of the knife. So a little burr of metal is actually coming up the length of the knife. You can't see that, but you're pulling 
that metal away evenly from the knife. If you're really good, you can take your finger nail, thumbnail, and just run it down edgewise like this, and you'll feel that burr. Don't run it this way because your knife's very sharp at this point, okay? So you're running it in this direction and you'll feel that little burr and you might even see a little bit of your fingernail abrading off onto the edge of the knife, okay? So that's what's happening when you're doing that. And so how is that helping? Well, imagine now that you're gonna turn that knife over and do the same thing and it's gonna pull that piece of burr away and it's gonna create a new burr going in the other direction. Well, how does that help? You're just gonna erode your knife away. Well, how that helps is now imagine doing it with different grits. So now you're starting with what we talked about earlier, 600 grit. You're taking a lot of metal and it's looking like that photo that I showed you where a lot of metal is coming off your knife. You're turning that knife over and doing it again in, on, the, on the opposite edge and that burr is breaking away and you're creating a new burr. Um, I've, I've seen, I've seen uh, demonstrations where people at the 600 grit level will, will do what this arrow suggests, pull it back upwards of 50 times. So 50 times on each side going, going to break that, to create that burr and then break the burr, create the burr, break the burr 50 times. Then they'll go to 1200 grit. The burr will be much smaller because you're a very, you're double the grit size, right? and they do 50 times there. Then they go to 4,500 grit and they do it 50 times there. Then they go to, eight, some people go to 8,000 grit and they do the same thing. And each time that burr is getting tinier and tinier and tinier, tinier until you have a real sharp edge, okay? So here, here's how I do it. So this is a, a very old piece of equipment that was given to me some time ago by a friend. And it's, it's not a spectacular piece of Christmas, uh, equipment. It, you know, it, it's, it's actually Chinese writing on it. So it came from China probably 40 years ago. Um, but I believe that this, um, this because it's almost glass-like, I believe this uh, stone is probably 4,500 to 6,000 grit. And, what it, and it rotates probably like an old 45 record on a phonograph. So it's probably about 45, 50 RPMs, which is pretty slow. And so I can, and here uh, you don't see it because I've taken it off, but there's a vat that uh, sits above it that just has a little spigot on the bottom that drips water onto it. And then the water flows into the side and out a, and out a little uh, uh, conduit on the other side. And so that thing's rotating around pretty slowly at about 4,500, about 45 RPM. I can put a knife on that and essentially mimic this dragging by just holding the knife still. And I'll just, I'll just hold it there for, you know, a few seconds, really, maybe 20 seconds, and then I'll turn the knife over and I'll do 20 seconds there. And then I know I've got something that's, you know, at this level that I'm interested in, maybe 4,500 to 600 grit, that's about as close a sharpening is that I find that I've needed at that point. I'd only go back to 600 grit and 1200 grit if I We have Mark pausing. Everyone else hear me? To keep away from putting. Uh huh. That knife or run the knife into a nail or something silly or a staple, and you've nicked. Go to honing because the manufacturer's edge would probably have gotten you to like a six or 8,000 grit already. And you just want to hone that to try to maintain that. Okay. Then the honing comes. And so, as we said earlier, I, I use th this for some simple honing. I use this for, um, for honing as well. If I, if you know, this I keep down in the, in my little shop in the basement, if I'm down there, I'll turn this on very briefly. It's, it's too fast really. So again, I just touch the knife on it very quickly. I'll take um, the polishing compound and just put it on the leather and then uh, 
down. You don't ever want to have the blade up because what will happen is that leather will catch the blade and all of a sudden the blade will be out of your hand. Okay. So if you're using something like this, even at the slow speed, Alec, that you're using yours at, you've probably seen this come to the same conclusion. You want that blade uh, sharp end facing in the direction of the travel, not against the direction of the travel. Okay. And as Murray was saying, I didn't realize there were different colors. I've just used this one and I, I just picked it up at Lee Valley. I think it was very inexpensive, but it's, it's a honing compound. And so while, while this is running, I'll just touch the honing compound on this and the leather will pick that up. Um, I have a friend who gave me a tip and he said, if you oil the leather, if you put a little oil on the leather before you put the honing compound on, it'll keep the honing compound from spitting off. Okay. Because sometimes, especially at this speed, you know, you want safety glasses because the honing compound will kind of chunk off when you're polishing. He puts, he treats the leather with just a light shine of oil. And that's just enough to keep the, to keep the compound on, on the leather. Okay. Okay. I'm just going to pause there then, because I think that's about all I wanted to say. Anything anybody wants to add or go back to? Uh, just Mark, I'd intervene just to, uh, the thought that that circular, uh, almost glass light surface, 45 RPM thing is a lot like the rock hounds use to do polishing. Hmm. And so it may well be something connected to that, but also going back to a, a comment that you made about some fellows doing the circular action. And that comes, I think, from us older guys that actually had shop classes and huh. real, <laughs> an old geezer that only did it one way. And when you, when one of the things we were taught to do is you had to sharpen your plane uh, bit or your blade, you know, the, in the plane. And we were doing the sharpening of that. We had to get it so sharp with that circular motion on different grades of stones that we would plane two pieces, two surfaces to be identical, glued together. And your pass mark was when he cracked it on the edge of the desk, mm -hmm. that glue joint wouldn't break. <laughs> Very that good. was because it was sharp. Yeah. But yeah. I think that the thing that you see, the, the other reason that uh, he told us that when we did that circular thing, is that you always kept your stone flat. If you go on just one area of the stone, you'll get a groove in it. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so it's just that varying the uh, surface area that you're cutting on the stone itself and keeping it even. Mm -hmm. That's old time stuff. Yeah, well, that's a good point, especially if, um, if you were sharpening a gouge, I could see how you could end up with a valley in the stone if you if you're always going to the same spot. Eh? Yeah. Any other comments? Mark, I have a question. Uh, this is for those. Uh, do you have any recommendation how to clean your shop once you apply the compound too many times? Usually it clogs up the, the, the shop, like it loads up the, the shop quite a bit. Like I've seen videos where people use alcohol, <laughs> rubbing alcohol to clean the leather shop, <laughs> or sometimes they use an eraser and they just rub on the, the strap and try and remove the compound from it. I've tried the eraser part, it works okay. Yeah, I, I've never run into that problem for this, uh, wh where the strap gets loaded up. Maybe somebody else uh, has and can chime in. I, when I uh, have, I was taught um, that that's what you want. <laughs> I was taught that the darker you get it, that means that uh, you're getting the higher, the higher number in terms of the grit. Mm -hmm. Any other comments? Well, uh, Mark, uh, what I usually use is just the back of the knife and just uh, rub it across the, the strop. And, and that seems to take off any uneven part of it. You don't really want to clean off all that compound, like as <coughs> Kevin just said. Another comment came to me by way of an older fellow that uh, when you start to think that you're maybe needing uh, some honing, you're, it's, it's not, your knife's not working well. One of the things he did was, he showed me that you turn a bright light on or even just the sunlight outside if you're outside and turn the blade over so you're looking at the sharp edge. 
if there's a nick on there at all, that nick will show up and shine. You'll see that you, you are in need of uh, some honing or perhaps you've done something, dropped the knife or whatever, and you'll end up with some nicks in that part. So as you turn it to this bright light, you should see nothing. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a good thought. Okay, so I hope that's helpful. Um, you guys have heard me mention Lynn Doughty's name uh, several times. He's just a tremendous carver down in the States, caricature carver down in the States. And I think we mentioned on an, on an earlier um, session that we had that he actually uses a Stanley knife to, to do his carving. And so he'll, you know, when his knife gets dull beyond what you could polish or hone, he'll just replace the knife blade. And, um, and so, you know, that's, that's another method to make sure that your knife is extremely sharp, sharp enough to do the kind of detail that we like to do in caricature carving. But that, you know, I bring up Lynn's name again, because like he'll make a point that even though he buys a brand new razor sharp Stanley blade, before he uses it, he hones it. So before he uses that, he puts on the polishing compound and he hones it because that razor sharp Stanley blade is too dull for him. Okay. So it, it, it just, it just kind of drives the point home that you want your, your knives absolutely surgically sharp. And, you know, just to bring it back to the, the safety part that, that Ken started to remind us of, if you're not using that thumb protector, that tape on your thumb protector, and you're drawing your knife towards you like this, just so that it lightly stops on your thumb. When your knife is this sharp, I can tell you from experience that when you put that thumb in, in uh, some solvent, when you're working out in the garage, you're gonna be dancing because you have made tiny little cuts all through your thumb print just by touching it. That's how sharp this knife is gonna be, okay? And that's how sharp you wanna have it when you're doing your detail carving. You wanna literally be able to touch the wood and with minimal, minimal um, uh, pressure, cut through those fibers of the wood, okay? Mark, I have a comment about the, the compound on the leather. <clears throat> yeah. I've seen a lot of people who get so much compound on there that they got big chunks and they can't spread it. They, they need to start with a very thin layer of uh, green compound or whatever color they want. And you can see the way it fades yeah. one end to the other. Yeah. It's black because that's metal dust coming off the knife. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I've used this same piece of leather and compound now for 14 years. Mm -hmm. And this side is even blacker. But it's the same idea. And most of the time you have trouble with too much compound is because people think more is better. Okay. And actually it's not. You put on a little bit, use the knife on it, put on a little more until it's a smooth surface instead of something with ridges and bumps in it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so that's a good point. And so maybe back to Fertis's earlier question, maybe what you need to do, Fertis, if you're getting that kind of buildup on your on the leather that Ken is just speaking to is somehow just scrape it off. And Mike's idea using the back of the knife or some, some flat piece of metal, you just want to scrape some of that off. That's a, that, that's a really Perfect. good thought. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Okay. Thanks everybody. That was a, that was a good discussion. I hope it was a good discussion. All right. So the next thing we wanted to do was talk about adding details. And so um, if I can, I'll just go right into that piece. Okay. And, and again, just stop me as we go through. If you have something to add or question, uh, please do that. Okay. This is supposed to feel more like a discussion than a presentation. Okay. So uh, when you're adding the details, so the roughing in has been done and now you want to kind of draw and carve in all of the essentials. Um, you know, again, come back to keep the tools super sharp. At the detail level, you're going to be putting in just that fine detail. If you're putting any pressure on that uh, gouge or knife at this point, you're going to crack and start breaking that fine detail that you're trying to put in. So keep the tool sharp and really watch proportions. And, um, you know, John, you, you, you did a good job the other day of talking to us about drawing. And, uh, and we've mentioned several times that a really uh, great resource for us is Pinterest.com. 
And if you just look up proportions or drawing proportions or sketching proportions, you'll get reams of information to give you a better idea on proportions of the face, on the body, on arms, legs, the whole nine yards. And so look at those proportions. Of course, when you're thinking about a caricature carving, um, things like the ears should be larger than normal. Things like the nose should be larger than normal. But at the end of the day, your carving has to look like a human being. And so referencing these proportions and then starting with that is really critical. So go to Pinterest, look for proportions and, and use that as a resource. Mike or John, you have anything to add about proportions? No, it's good, very good. Okay. Um, and then I would say add the details that contribute to the story. And so th this is my method of adding details. And so you can see here, you know, I think I've shown you this, this slide before. This is a little Canada Day beaver when we celebrated our sesquicentennial. I, uh, I did this, called him another dam carver. And so what are kind of the details you'd add to a, uh, you know, a little beaver carver here? Well, I put a little ruler in its pouch. I put a little pencil there. Um, you can see I, I added a pouch. I added uh, with a wood burner some stitching on the leather apron. Um, if you can see the little rivets around the pouch, those are just little pin heads that I put in place. And so think about the kind of details you'd add that really bring out the story of, of the carving that you're making. When, uh, when my granddaughter was born, I used the same little theme to, uh, she was born on Canada Day. So I made her this with a little music box in it. And so this time, you know, I added the, the thought that he made a little sign that says, Papa loves Ada, Ada is her name. And so a couple of paintbrushes this time go in and a, and a, and a bright maple leaf that he painted. Okay, so you're just thinking of all of the little details that uh, you tend to add. Um, I'd also say experiment with materials. You know, we're, you know, a lot of people think that when we go to a show or a competition that the judges are going to be all over us if everything isn't out of wood. Well, that's not the case. If, if you have a little bit of material other than wood in your carving, that's acceptable. If, you, if, it, if it's a third, you know, 30% of your carving, that's obviously not acceptable. It is a carving show and a carving competition. But adding extra materials, I find it's fun. I find I, I really enjoy the carding, carving more if I can add some other materials to it. And, it. and it's certainly not frowned upon. So here, this is part of a, a larger carving that I did where I wanted to add a toaster. And so I carved this out of a piece of wood. And with a wood burner, I dimpled the, the toast to make it look like toast. But the, the, the uh, metal portion of this toaster is just that, it's metal tape. And so you guys have, have seen the, uh, the HVAC tape that you might use on a furnace or something. Uh, it's, an, it's an aluminum tape, it's sticky on one side. So after I carved this thing out of wood, I put that aluminum tape, instead of painting it, I put that aluminum tape over the carving. And then with just the back of a spoon or something, I burnished it down so it really stuck well. And it looks like a metal toaster now, okay? So don't be afraid of using little pieces of material other than wood to enhance your carving. Another carving I did, uh, um, the, car the carving um, had, a, had a, actually a dog playing a banjo. And so I made this banjo and it's all carved out of wood. But again, that shiny part is that metal tape again. And so that, that aluminum tape, you can put down, burnish in place, adhesive back, it stays there forever. And it's soft enough, then you can come back with a tool. And I came back with a center punch and I made all of those decorative pieces and it's really quick to do. Uh, the strings are just some very fine optical wire that was stranded together and I, un I unraveled it and, and I glued all of that in place. So, you know, again, don't be afraid to use different materials and it, it'll only <coughs> enhance your carving. I did a, a window washer. And so I wanted the window washer on a, a little swing there, you know, high, high in the air washing windows. Well, that rope is, um, is wire. And so it's just 
a household copper wire, took the insulation off of it. I sanded it lightly so that a uh, paint would adhere to it. I took two strands. Um, I, I nailed one end to the end of my uh, workbench and put the other two, the other end of the two strands in my, uh, my battery operated drill and I slowly wound it. And so that's what it ended up looking like. So here's, here's the, um, here's what, here, here were the pieces. And so the first piece was that strand after I sanded it, crimped the end. You can't make a knot in it. So I made the knot like this. And then I slipped that knot through here and then I soldered that. And now I have a piece of rope that, that in fact looks like a piece of rope. So again, you know, don't be afraid of adding, like if you're just talking about the, you know, the carving being one and 2% out of metal, uh, go ahead and do that. It, it'll make your carving look a lot of nicer and, it, and it's enjoyable. Uh, this is a, a carving a person asked me to do of their Basset Hound reading a paper at the beach. And so that paper is um, shim stock. And so it's, it's brass sheet. And if, you, if you've ever been around uh, maintenance people that were leveling a pump, the footings on a pump or a motor, this is the shim that goes underneath it. And so I, I just, again, abraded that shim stock so it would take paint. I uh, crumpled it up to make it look like a newspaper. I painted it with a matte acrylic and then with a um, just a very soft lead pencil, I put in all of those little things like, uh, you know, all treats 25% off. Of course, the writing are just dots and dashes, but it looks like writing, right? So again, it's not wood, but uh, <coughs> fun to do, easy to do, and uh, it just makes your carving more interesting. Okay, any comments so far? Oh, it's great. Mark, it's, uh, just going back to uh, um, uh, to to putting stitching in, I use this tool. It actually is a stitching tool that you can get at a fabric shop. It's got a little spiked wheel on it, and you just roll it along the carving, and very easy to put stitching on a carving. Very good. Very good. Yeah, pretty fine. Is, is it pretty fine, the, the, like the little teeth on it? I yeah, I'd say this wheel is maybe five eighths in in diameter. Yeah, yeah. Hey, that's and really so good. Each, yeah, you can each get little them. Uh, each little point is probably a thirty second of an inch apart. Yeah, very good. You can get them in different sizes for leather work. Ah, yeah. And another note I would make is it's refreshing to hear that judges are not that critical about adding three or four percent to a carving yeah and and i think that's the key ken is you know you don't want to overdo it you know we we've all gone to carving shows and seen a, a beautiful carving and the person um didn't ruin it but made it less attractive by finding a bunch of seashells or rocks and gluing them in place that's that's a little over the board now you're talking well that's 20 percent of the overall volume of the carving right but if, it, if it's insignificant little things and it adds to the carving, then for the, the kind of shows that we tend to go to, there's not going to be an issue. You know, if there's an international show somewhere in Amsterdam they, and they say it has to be all wood, well, they're serious about it there. But the, the kind of shows we go to, that's, that, that's not an issue. If I could step in here just for a minute, Mark, uh, it, it basically depends on what the, each individual club's rules are you know, according to their judging of their shows. Uh, a lot of the shows in the United States, uh, uh, you can get away with, with uh, added things up until the open and advanced class. Then it has to be 100% wood. But, know. Uh, you know, in the intermediate and the, and the beginners, uh, they don't frown on that. It's just on the open class, it's, it's a lot of them stick to that rule. Yeah, yeah, it probably really depends on the location. I know that the, the wildlife and, uh, you know, bird carvers are a little bit more granular about it than, than, than the general carvers and caricature carvers, but you're right, it probably, it's probably worth, like, if you're going to a show, just check beforehand, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, the other thing that, that I like to do is uh, use a burning tool, and so you remember that little beaver, he was wearing a, uh, a toque. 
I'll just go back. I don't know how good a pic. Yeah, you can see it a little bit. You can see the stitching in the toque a little bit in these two pictures, right? So that wasn't done with a knife at all. That was done with a burning tool. And so this is a razor tip burning tool. Um, there, there are a number of really good burning tools that you can get, but the, the tip is, is literally like a razor. So you can burn all of those cross hatched pieces in and make it look like a, a knitted hat. I've done the same thing. I've done a couple of carvings with a, a, a rug. And this, in, the, in this case, excuse me, the rug is, uh, is rolled up. But again, I just make a herringbone design after I've carved the rows, I make a herringbone design and, uh, and use it by using the burning tool. The really nice thing about this is that when you go to paint this, because a rug like this has alternating colors, you'll find that now that you've made the little valley with the wood burning tool, that you just need to dab the acrylic uh, watery paint in one of those little rectangles, rectangles and it won't go any farther than that valley. And so it's not like, you know, you're painstakingly painting every rectangle. You just dab, 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 dab. It flows as far as that valley and no further. So, so think about that when you're, when you're putting in detail. You can use the same principle for, um, you know, if you're painting, if, uh, if I was painting somebody that had a shirt on, but also had a vest. Well, if I took that wood burning tool and made a little valley between the vest and the shirt, it, it again makes a little valley or dam for the, um, for the paint. So, you know, despite the, the fact that my hand tends to shake when I paint, I can just dab it close to there. It flows as far as that valley and no further. And I can separate those two colors a little more easily. Uh, the final thing I guess I'll, I'll mention here is uh, wrinkles and creases are really important. And so now that you've done your carving, you've put in the kind of details you want. The thing that really brings, a, for me anyway, a caricature to life is having the right creases and wrinkles in your shirt. And, your, and pants, so all of the clothing. And so if you, you know, if you look at what I'm wearing right now, you know, you can see that, you know, the, the shirt is being pulled so that the creases are coming down here. I would try to, I would try to detail that in to some extent on, uh, on my carving. Um, not every wrinkle and crease is nice and crisp. Sometimes your, your uh, shirt will just ripple, you know, and so you'll get in undulating sort of valleys, use a gouge to make that get away from just flat spots on clothing, you know, give it some life, okay? And, uh, and again, a prime, prime reference is things like Pinterest. Um, you know, you can look up clothing folds and wrinkles and get things like this. Um, I've stood in front of a mirror and taken a picture of myself in front of a mirror. I've had my, my, uh, my wife Peggy take a picture of me wearing a, a sports jacket so I'd understand where the wrinkles are. So really think about that. Get the wrinkles right. Like, uh, you know, that's a real key part is getting the wrinkles right. Sometimes you see somebody trying to put wrinkles in and they've gone in the wrong direction. You want to make sure you get them in the right, in the right order. So here's an example of of that hockey player that I did some time ago. This, this is a, a, you know, a very blockish, uh, you know, almost simple in terms of its posture, but it was, it was really difficult for me to understand what the wrinkles would look like. So I had to really, you know, uh, get a lot of pictures of hockey players hanging over the, the boards. I eventually did this in clay so that I would be able to test to make sure the wrinkles were going in the right direction and that the shoulder pads, it made the shoulder pads look like they were standing out. So doing the clay figure to, to putting the, every detail of the wrinkle in really helped me, okay? And similarly with this guy here. So this is the, the little hobo that's on the, uh, the pump rail car. And so again, it was important for me to get the wrinkles right. And so I, I, I kind of researched it a little bit and said, okay, where do the wrinkles have to go? What are the right directions? I wanted the tail of his jacket to look like it was blowing in the wind. So it had to have that sort of wavy period. I wasn't sure what the wrinkles up around his shoulder blades were going to look like. So that was the situation where I put a sports jacket on and I held my arms up in the air and Peggy took a picture of me and I used that as a, as a reference. So, so I have uh, a question. Yeah, it's Daniel. Now, I just I was just wondering, when is too much 
uh, wrinkles. Like, um, do, you, do, you know, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think is, so. Is, is there is there a too too much? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I can. I understand what you're saying. You know, you 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 could probably take away from the carving to make it look having a look too wrinkles. Um, I, I would say that in my experience and in, in carvings that I've seen, I would say that that they usually fall on too few wrinkles, that everything is sort of the same plane, you know. And so, yeah. if you, you, you know, even if you look at everybody on the uh, on the uh, on the call here, you know, John or, or Dave, you're wearing a, 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 a blue shirt, I think, right now. And you can really see, you know, how much poorer a carving would look if it was just plain flat chest flat arms right but okay. just having the number of wrinkles that you see in the little valleys there it really brings the carving out the and, and the other thing you know not to pick on you david here but the other thing that the wrinkles do is when you get to painting and that's what we're going to talk about next time we're together it gives you the opportunity to put different colors of the same tone in your carving that brings out the contour and the wrinkles that much better so you can see although you know Dave's wearing a blue shirt there's different blues you know there's the blue that's on the crest of the of the wrinkle and then there's right. the blue that is much darker in the valley of the wrinkle and so when we come back and talk about painting we're going to talk about painting it all in one color of blue and then coming back with a darker tone and getting in those valleys and wrinkles and all of a sudden now you have, it brings out the full three dimension of the carving, you know. Super, thank you, thanks very much. Thanks, Dan. Okay, so listen, um, we kind of covered everything we wanted. Uh, we're, we're, gonna be, we're gonna be rolling to a stop in five minutes, but um, uh, any additional comments or, or questions for any of us, uh, that'd be great. I would, I would like to I would like to uh, say that uh, anybody that carves with a knife and then they if anybody uses sandpaper if you sand down your carving a little bit and you go back with a knife your knife's going to get really dull real quick got, there's little sand particles sandpaper particles on your carving now mm. so then once you start hitting it with a knife again your, your knife's going to get real dull real quick mm. so if you do any sanding at all do it at the very end yeah, and don't touch your knife again with a knife. Mm -hmm. I have a drawing question for John. Yep. If I can. Yeah, no uh, problem. Yes, uh, John, you mentioned that you yeah, you carved the body from a two by three block, yep. then you do yep. the head in a two by two. Yeah. Uh, in that two inches are you are you leaving are you providing for a half in, in that two inches or is is that the head width that you're going to use that's uh, just the head like just the head so you're going to put a if you're going to put a hat on it you're going to go for a wider piece right right that, so this, okay. the, usually i do the hat separate <clears throat> but uh this is a two by two okay all right so the hat the head is is uh is uh, is really greatly en emphasized on that body then. Yeah, yeah exactly. Oversize. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Like, okay. Uh, uh, and and what about is is there a when you're when you're uh, when you're drawing, you know, you've got the width of the head. What about the depth? How how deep uh, is it? Deeper than than the width? It should be a little deeper, shouldn't it? Uh, say, it, say it again. From the well, from the tip of the nose to the back of the head. Right. How much space would you be using there relative to the width of the head from here oh, to here? Oh. Yeah, this this is uh, two inches by two inches. Oh. Okay. Could you lift it two up inch. a bit? Okay. Two. 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 Okay. By two. Okay. This one is two by two, but uh, like for him, this guy here. I went to two inches wide. Yep. I think this, I think this is uh, because of his nose is so big. This was two and a half. Okay. I added a little more for his, his nose. All right. 
it's, it's just a judgment. You know, you got to just figure it out. Like if. Yeah. 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 Okay. Is, is there uh, uh, maybe, fellas, uh, uh, an opportunity to, uh, you know, you're talking about wrinkles and, and, and features. Uh, could uh, maybe John, uh, you know, I know we're running out of time tonight, but could you do some, give us a, an overview of, of putting some of the, uh, the features in a face, you know, the, uh, the, the intricacies around the eyes and some of the wrinkles, mm. expressions for, you know, the oh, okay. happy, bad face, uh, you know, whatever, you know, the whole variety. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, 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 let's let's cover that next time. Well, that, that's a little more. Uh, I need yeah. a little more time for that. Yeah. Okay. But uh, I, I look forward to that. I, I hope okay. the others like it. Yeah. Right on. Thank you. This is Stan. I wonder if I have a, asked a question about the wood types. I I know that it sounds like most of the. Um, the caricature carving is done out of basswood and uh, perhaps one or two others, but what are some of the alternative wood types that you're using? Um, just curious, because I use a lot of hardwoods um, and it sounds like you're using more of a softer base wood. Yeah, I, I generally use basswood, Stan. I, I find that if I can get a nice piece of basswood uh, that's, that's clear, uh, I, I just get a lot more enjoyment of using the basswood. If I'm um, if I'm making a carving or a portion of the carving looks like it's going to be under a little bit of stress or it might be a little bit weak, I'll use cherry or maple and add it to the carving. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you add that to the carving. Yeah, I'll add it to if there's going to be a real delicate piece that I'm making. I won't try to do it out of basswood because I know it'll it'll just snap or break off. I'll I'll add that. So an example of that would be, you know, if I was doing um, a cowboy holding a rifle, the rifle would be cherry or maple. You know, it just gets too small to to think about trying to use basswood in my mind. Anyway, that's the way I do it. Okay, interesting because I've never used basswood. I use everything else but. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for answering. I have a question. Is it sacrilegious to use a Dremel tool to carve? Yeah, uh, Mike, uh, John, I, I've got a thought on that. But if you guys want to jump in, go ahead, go ahead, uh, Mark. I don't, I don't use a Dremel at all, at all, not too much, anyhow. I don't use any Dremels either. So, okay, well, I've I've used uh, Dremel on a caricature carving. Uh, when I when I do a caricature carving and when I look at a caricature carving, I prefer to see the knife marks, all of the nice clean chip knife marks in it. And so to John's earlier point, very little sanding. If, if anything gets sanded, it might be the cheeks or something on a, on a caricature carving. But I, I like to see it nice and crisp. I'll use a Dremel if I'm making something very specific and it's really hard to get at with um, with the um, with the knife. The, the thing that I would say about using a Dremel, understand that when you're using a Dremel with basswood, the basswood is gonna fuzz up a little bit. It's gonna get a little bit of little fuzz on it, okay? Cause you're abrading it, right? And regardless, yes. of how, regardless of how fine a Dremel bit you have, it's gonna abrade. And so the way that, that I've gotten around that is after I've abraded it and it's, got, it's pulled the fibers up and it's gotten fuzzy, I'll paint that with um, urethane thinned down by 50% with uh, turpentine or thinner. Okay, so it's very, very thin urethane. And I'll paint that section, let it dry completely. And then I'll come back to it when it's hard and all those little fibers that stood up are hard. I'll cut that down with maybe 600 grit uh, sanding paper. Okay, 600 is very fine, right? And so I'll just yes. cut that down and that'll just take that fuzziness away and it'll still look as smooth as the rest of the carving. Okay. Yes, I have done that, but I've diluted okay. it with water and it oh, seems you, to work quite well. Oh, you must have used a, a, a water-based urethane then, yeah. Yes, I did. Yeah, yeah, that'll work great. And it ended up being being like glass, but that's how I, what I wanted it to look yeah. like. Perfect, yeah. Thank I, you. I, try, I uh, worked with uh, butternut 
carving with a butter knife with a knife and uh butternut's really nice to carve with hard to find eh john yeah it's hard to find now yeah yeah but that was yeah. i got a little bit left <laughs> yeah send it to ontario yeah <laughs> <laughs> Okay, folks, uh, that's probably our, our time commitment for tonight. So thanks for joining us. And uh, I think the third week of June is the 17th. So we'll shoot for that. And we want to talk about uh, finishing in terms of painting the caricature carving. And uh, as it was raised just a little bit earlier, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about uh, what to think about in terms of carving the face as well. Okay, so we'll be prepared to talk about that. So thanks very much. And uh, back to your gardens. Yes. Thanks. And, and I got one more thing. Right? Okay. One last comment. Thank you very much. It was my first meeting. I had a really good time and an excellent time. Good. Thanks, Daniel.